Welcome back to Aero Talks. Today, we're digging into a metal that's absolutely critical for flight, but maybe doesn't get the spotlight it deserves. Titanium. That's right. It's incredibly lightweight, super strong, perfect for aerospace. Uh, it actually absorbs about half of all the titanium produced globally. Half? Yeah. Wow. So securing it isn't just about, you know, market prices. It's really a strategic game. Exactly. And that's the core of what we're looking at today. The geopolitical risk around titanium, it's not going away. In fact, our sources, like analysis from Project Blue, suggest it's actually set to tighten. Tighten? Why now? Well, think back. We had that temporary surplus, a kind of safety net, partly because of the B737MX issues, and then, of course, COVID-19 hitting demand hard. Right. Production slowed down. But that buffer, it's gone. Aircraft makers are scrambling now to ramp up production again. Orders are piling up. Okay, so let's unpack the geography here. Where is this strategic choke point? It's pretty stark. By 2024 figures, China and Russia together controlled something like 74% of the world's capacity for titanium sponge. Sponge. Remind us what that is. Ah, right. So titanium sponge is the sort of raw, porous metal you get right after the initial chemical processing. It's the step before you can melt it down into ingots for making actual aerospace parts. Got it. And China alone has. China holds about 63% of that initial sponge capacity. Russia has another 11%. Huge concentration right at the start. And does that control continue down the line? to the finished parts. It absolutely does. If you look further down at what are called milled products, the finished forms used in aircraft, they control about 76% of that market combined. 76%. Yeah. And it's interesting, Russia's historical strength was more in the complex industrial processing. Yeah. They even used to rely partly on Ukraine for feedstock. Okay. China, meanwhile, has poured money into building capacity. They're not quite, let's say, fully up to Western aerospace quality standards across the board yet, but they're investing heavily and crucially, collaborating more with Russia. Collaborating? Well, China might send raw feedstock to Russia and then import aerospace-grade sponge back from them. It creates this interdependence that makes isolating either one much harder for the West. Right. And all this is happening while demand is just taking off. Completely. The pressure on manufacturers like Boeing and Airbus is immense. We're talking thousands of planes on order. Project Blue estimates the industry needs over 1.6 million tons of titanium between now and 2044. 1.6 million tons. And by the late 2040s, commercial aircraft alone could make up almost 90% of the annual demand. So you have this perfect storm, surplus gone, demand soaring, and supply controlled by just two major players. Which leads to the obvious question. Why can't Western companies just switch suppliers, diversify faster? Ah, if only it were that simple. I mean, surely there are other places that produce titanium. There are, but the single biggest hurdle, the real bottleneck, is qualification. Certification. Qualification? Explain that. Okay, so this isn't like finding a new supplier for, say, standard steel bolts. Mm -hmm. For aerospace, Every material has to be proven, rigorously tested, to withstand incredible stresses. Think about flying at 35,000 feet. Right. Failure is not an option. Exactly. So getting a new titanium source certified as aerospace grade takes, well, it often takes 10 years, sometimes more. Years of testing, documentation, regulatory approvals. 10 years. Wow. Okay, that changes the picture. It really does. That built-in lag means that companies like Boeing and Airbus have very few immediate options for scaling up supply from sources they consider um, geopolitically tolerable. So who are the immediate options then, even if limited? Based on current capabilities and politics, the sources point mainly to Japan, maybe Kazakhstan, and potentially Saudi Arabia. These are places they could possibly ramp up sponge production relatively quickly. But that's just sponge production, right? What about melting capacity? Good point. They'd still need the capacity elsewhere to melt that sponge into usable forms. So it's still a complex puzzle. And longer-term ideas, like boosting U.S. production or India. Those are definitely strategic goals. Mm -hmm. There's talk of reviving U.S. domestic sponge production, and India is increasing its capacity. But these aren't quick fixes. They won't solve the supply crunch for, say, 2026. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, a lot of the current U.S. Department of Defense funding seems more focused on improving recycling of titanium scrap, what we call secondary supply, rather than the massive decade-long investment needed for new primary sponge capacity. Okay, so limited short-term options, long-term goals are still distant. Now, you mentioned a wild card. Yes, COMAC, oh. China's own commercial aircraft manufacturer. They're emerging. They have thousands of orders all ready for their jets mainly domestic for now. And the worry is? As Comac ramps up its production significantly, 
China might naturally decide to prioritize its own domestic aerospace industry. Keep that crucial titanium supply chain feeding COMAC first. Which could mean less available for Boeing and Airbus. Potentially, yes. It could redirect feedstock, including material potentially coming out of Russia, away from the global market, and towards China's internal needs. That could really squeeze Western manufacturers. Is this pattern unique to titanium? Not entirely. Yes. We see similar dynamics with other critical aerospace materials. Take rhenium, for example. Rhenium. Used in engines. Exactly. Vital for high-temperature turbine blades in jet engines. About 80% of it goes into aerospace. And guess what? China is actively building its market share there, too. It's a broader strategic push. So wrapping this up, what's the key takeaway for you know people watching the industry? I think the bottom line is that the Western aerospace sector is caught in a really tough spot. You've got this huge surge in demand hitting right up against a supply chain that's heavily concentrated in geopolitically risky areas. And fixing that concentration, diversifying properly, isn't a quick fix. It's a decade-long challenge, minimum. Precisely. It's going to take at least that long to unwind this reliance. It's quite possible, maybe even likely, that we'll see military and space programs, because they're seen as so strategic, needing to drive the initial investment in building out these alternative, secure, niche supply chains. Before the commercial side can fully benefit. Yeah, they might pave the way, absorbing the initial costs and risks, because national security demands it. A complex picture with no easy answers in the short term. Thank you for listening. We will see you in the next episode.